Welcome to the Hydrogen Struggles Leadership Podcast, the premier provider of leadership consulting, culture shaping, and senior level executive search services. Every day, we're privileged to talk with fascinating people who are shaping the future through their leadership and vision. Each episode, you'll hear a different perspective from thought leaders and innovators. Thanks for listening to the Hydrogen Struggles Leadership Podcast. Hi, I'm Giulia Uticone, Principal at Hydrogen Struggles and member of the Corporate Officers Practice. In today's podcast, I'm talking to Paolo Quaini, Group General Counsel at Alitalia, the flag carrier and the largest airline of Italy. Paolo joined Alitalia in 2017 after a few years as Group General Counsel at OTB. Before that, he was Group General Counsel at Cementil, Senior Attorney at Parmalat and Legal Department Director at the Kind. Paolo, welcome and thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thanks to you, Giulia, for inviting me. I'm really delighted to be here with you today. Paolo, you have worked in different industries in your career. How has this differentiation helped you develop as a leader? Well, I have to tell you that I, I consider myself pretty lucky uh, to have had the opportunity in my uh, almost 20 years and of experience as in house, in house counsel to attend the different business sectors. Uh, as, you, as you already mentioned, first uh, plant making, then food, then construction materials, uh, then fashion, and finally the air transport. Uh, well, I, I believe that all this has enriched me enormously in terms of experience because each, each sector has its own peculiarity and from each I have taken away learnings that I was then able to put into practice in my subsequent experiences. Uh, just to give an example, from the plant making sector, uh, where business mainly consists of manufacturing large industrial plants around the world, I learned to develop a deep focus on compliance, uh, anti-corru- anti-corruption uh, safeguards, which then turned out to be very useful even in sectors less sensitive to, the, to these issues. Uh, By the way, this principle works uh, not only from the cross-sector perspective, but also in the context of the different uh, types and kind of companies. I'm thinking uh, at listed company versus family business or uh, B2C versus B2B. And even here, to give you an example, the experience I accumulated in the field of governance in listed companies has proved to be very useful for me in the uh, reorganization of the corporate governance of family businesses, for instance. I just said that I consider myself lucky, uh, lucky in particular to have met on my path HR directors and CEOs who have never considered the origin from the industry as a condition precedent for hiring me. Unfortunately, in Italy, still today, there are many companies that have a sort of silo approach and do not understand that in reality, coming from different sector is not a handicap. To the contrary, it's a a strength of the GC they are going to hire because the company will be able to draw on its so diversified know-how and benefit from how much the GC has learned in its previous experiences in other industries. Very interesting, Paolo, thank you. And which are the cons that you see in moving from one sector to the other? Of course, there is a a transition uh, phase uh, uh, which has to be faced, particularly uh, if you do not know the business. At the beginning, you just have to listen to the others and uh, be humble. When one is is new in in an organization, uh, you have the tendency, you know, to to show yourself as a very expert guy. Uh, I know everything, etc. This is, of course... uh, Uh, wrong if you are coming to a new sector. You just have to be humble, listen, take your uh, 100 days uh, period, and then uh, I'm sure everything will be fine. What leadership Hmm. skills have been essential for you and your team in order to thrive? You you probably know that uh, Alitalia in the past uh, four years uh, has uh, uh, navigated in in the extraordinary administration, which is an insolvency uh, proceeding where Alitalia entered into in 2017. Um, it, it might seem a paradox, but I do believe that the fact that Alitalia employees, including, of course, our legal team, 
We are coming from three years of extraordinary administration at the time of uh, the outbreak of the pandemic. And therefore, it was coming from a full-blown and, and permanent crisis situation uh, has been very helpful in managing COVID. Uh, of course, this might not be true for the company as a whole and for its business. The business of Alitalia was uh, already struggling at the time of, of, of the outbreak of the pandemic. And, and for sure, the pandemic gave to it the final blow. It's sufficient to, to remember that in a matter of weeks, in, in March 2020, the air traffic went down to almost zero, which means uh, almost zero turnover for the company. But from a people perspective, our legal team, as well as the other functions, was already used to working in an emergency and stressed conditions. And each member of the team was used to perform his or her role with maximum flexibility and interchangeability. So to answer your question, I, I do believe that our previous experience in crisis and emergency, emergency management, even if not in a sanitary emergency, has been the extra gear and the decisive factor for us uh, to support the company in navigating the pandemic. And in fact, uh, talking about 2020 specifically being a complex year for everyone, how have last year's challenges uh, supported in the refocusing of your priorities as general counsel? To what we understood is uh, how a crisis can affect uh, the organization, particularly uh, when it is not a, a kind of crisis which is codified under the operation of the company. Normally, the occurrence of a crisis makes companies realize that they are not prepared for managing them, and COVID was no exception. And even more infrequent is that companies adopt procedures to prevent the occurrence of the crisis. Most of the companies just address the typical risks of the business they carry out. Of course, this poor capability of companies to prevent crises also depends on the exceptional nature of the crisis. But most of the time, the attention of companies and, and their procedures turns more on how to manage the crisis once it is revealed than how to prevent it. At most, training and risk monitoring are contemplated. But risk monitoring and training are not prevention tools. It's... Uh, just a way to get better prepared to uh, face the crisis. And COVID, for instance, taught us that our regulatory system in Alitalia was not so sophisticated and exhaustive, or rather it was, but only in relation to possible crises codified in the company's operations. And just to give you some example, of course, uh, uh, it's something that in, in the airlines you don't like uh, uh, listening and talking about, but of course, the typical risks of, a, of an airline are plane crashes, hijackings, terrorist attacks, natural disasters. Well, of course, an airline is very much prepared to face and to manage this kind of crisis. Probably a key lesson we learn from COVID is that we need to review our policies and procedures on crisis management to make them suitable for preventing and uh, uh, facing risks that are not codified for us, like sanitary risks. But these uncodified risks are equally dangerous for, for a company like ours. And I guess this will also be a priority for me as GC and the head of uh, regulatory affairs in the months to come. And in fact, uh, on top of policies and procedures that you're mentioning, as general counsel supporting the crisis, uh, how has it changed over the months in your role? If you remember, during the first lockdown in March and April last year, uh, Alitalia played an important role in Italy, bringing home thousands of uh, Italian citizens who were abroad at the time of the outbreak. Uh, we converted some of our passenger planes into cargo to transport uh, medical supplies, uh, masks, respirators, and anything else which was needed to face the pandemic. This was the very beginning. Now we are still affected uh, because uh, the, the passengers' traffic is very low 
and mostly limited to domestic flights and we just uh, have uh, a low number of international destinations. So in this, uh, I, would, I would call it uncomfortable and complex environment, myself and, and my team uh, have been called to first to verify and interpret the regulatory measures that have been implemented by both the national government and the EU authorities. You will remember that there was a, a period in, uh, in uh, last springtime where almost every week we had new regulations uh, and then we also got the EU regulations. So uh, all this was a, a bunch of uh, rules which uh, as legal department we are called to interpret and to, to read, uh, basically to provide guidelines for our operations uh, units and then, of course, overall, to protect the corporate interest. And then uh, another, another problem we had to face is that we had to reconcile the corporate interest with uh, uh, fulfilling the passenger's rights. At the time, we got plenty of, uh, you know, cancellation flights uh, or denied boarding or uh, complaints for passengers. And, uh, of course, this was a, a big bunch of, of, of job for us. Once the first uh, and the frantic phase of the, of the emergency have been overcome, so we uh, basically measures have been taken, the management of the COVID risk has been stabilized and, uh, we, and became fully operational. Another and last activities we, we, we were being occupied in the, in the recent months uh, as legal department and as general counsel is uh, renegotiation of contracts. Of course, COVID-19 is a factor which can lead to a force majeure. And so what we try to do is to renegotiate on an equitable basis the business contracts of the company, which were no longer needed or were, which were exorbitant due to the lockdown. Uh, just to give you some example, aircraft leasing contracts, supply of uh, onboard catering, airport handling services. And this was made in Italy and abroad. Uh, and abroad, uh, things were even more difficult because if you, if you remember, the pandemic uh, uh, had not arrived in all countries simultaneously. So we were discussing with people in other countries who were not affected by COVID. So they simply did not understand our problem. And also due to the different regulation. But I have to say it has been a very tough and uh, consuming period for us. Thinking about uh, becoming operational again, as you said, and looking ahead, what is the Alitalia future forward strategy? As you might have read on the, on the news, currently Alitalia is, is in a transition phase between uh, the extraordinary administration and uh, ITA, which is the new co uh, established by the state uh, to own and develop a new Italian airline. So uh, it's easy to say that it will be up to the top management of ITA to define the future strategy of the airline. Uh, personally, I think, however, that a pillar of such strategy will necessarily have to be sustainability. Sustainability, uh, depending on the various industries, has become or, or is become a real priority for business companies. In the uh, aviation sector, we should say that sustainability is slowly become a priority. Today, I don't think it still, it, it still is. Aviation industry, industry has traditionally been considered a dirty industry, and in fact, in fact it is quite so. Just to give you some, some examples, some numbers, the aviation sector is responsible for about 2% of all CO2 produced by humankind, and emissions have grown exponentially in the last uh, six, uh, seven years. In Europe, for instance, by 25% from 2013 to today. Just think that a long haul plane in flight consumes between 80 and 240 liters of jet fuel per minute. So this is a trend we, which will necessarily have to be reversed in the coming year. And I, I think that the air transport sector will have no choice but to align with the general trend that sees sustainability as a real priority for companies in the next five to ten years. What challenges do you foresee for the industry in the next five years and how are you preparing to face them? The answer is easy. How to get there is not that easy. I believe the main challenge for the aviation sector in the next five years 
is to definitely exit the crisis generated by COVID and bring air traffic back to the levels of 2019, which unfortunately, or to some extent, unfortunately, we are pretty high. It will be uh, neither easy nor quick for the aviation sector to emerge from this crisis. We now start seeing uh, shy signs of recovery, but it, it's still a long way. Furthermore, it will be essential to restore the confidence of passengers to use the plane. Today, flying is uh, seen as a risk uh, due to the fact that there is no um, interpersonal distances in, in, in the aircrafts. Here, I believe that the, the, the COVID vac uh, vaccine campaign will play a decisive role. Then we also changed our habits. Smart working has made us find out new ways to meet in virtual meetings. And we do expect to uh, see a decline in travel for business purposes. And the, the industry uh, for sure will, ha will have to address this issue. Of course, we, we hope, uh, we do hope for a return to pre-COVID normality as soon as possible. Uh, because in the end, uh, human contact uh, it still remains something that we as social animals uh, need. Fortunately, uh, while business meetings can also be done remotely, holidays, at least for the time being, cannot. And this is where we have to uh, look for our customers. Closing on the positive note, uh, what, uh, what's the most important way your organization is building on the lessons of 2020? Well, compared to the other crisis situation we faced uh, during uh, our uh, four years administration, uh, extraordinary administration, I think that a new factor introduced at the organization level by COVID is for sure smart working. The pandemic has uh, uh, resulted for our employees as well as for other companies in a, in a deep change on the way we work. Our company immediately adopted and, and uh, continues to adopt smart working, uh, but we were not prepared to do that. That was not something that Alitalia was used to do before. Now, the vast majority of our employees, uh, including our uh, legal team, is working remotely. We have, of course, people who still work in presence, and uh, I'm referring to uh, of the flight operating person, of course, and also the ground personnel. They have no choice but to work in presence. Beyond the initial difficulties, I think that smart working has brought benefits uh, uh, to both the employee and the employer. Of course, managing day-by-day -day needs and resources has generated uh, some additional complexity uh, compared to the traditional mode. But overall, our experience is positive and I believe that smart working even if to a lesser extent than today, it will be a tool that our company will uh, keep using uh, even in the post-pandemic phase. And uh, coming to me, I think that how to best combine smart working on an ordinary basis, uh, which means beyond the COVID, COVID emergency, with the mission of the legal department uh, will certainly be one of my uh, top priorities as a general counsel for the months to come. Paolo, thank you for making the time to speak with us today and looking forward to host you again in the future. Thanks to you. It was a real pleasure for me. Bye-bye. Bye, Paolo. Thanks for listening to the Hydrogen Struggles Leadership Podcast. To make sure you don't miss more future shaping ideas and conversations, please subscribe to our channel on the podcast app. And if you're listening via LinkedIn, Twitter or YouTube, Why not share this with your connections? Until next time.